around us. God is still good and he still deserves to be praised, right? Amen. Amen. So through the storm, we're going to praise him. Through the good times and the bad times, he still deserves all of our praise. All right? God is good. God is good.
sharing the Lord's Supper. We are going to sing verse 1 and the chorus of the hymn, and can it be, as we invite the deacons who are duty to come forward and join me at the Lord's table. Invite persons who might be from a different congregation or colleagues of faith, that you are also able to share with us in the Lord's Supper at the Lord's table. Invite the deacons forward as we sing, and can it be. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Guide me for me who cause his pain for me who came to
So God, as we lift up our prayers of confession, we stand upon your word that tells us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we confess and receive your assurance of pardon. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. 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 What a great grace God has given us. And we are reminded time and time again about that wonderful opportunity to come before God. It is the scripture Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never be hungry. Whoever drinks of me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with them. And then with me. As we prepare to share at this well spread table, the table that has been prepared by our Lord, and will lead us in the prayer of preparation, then we will listen to the words of institution, after which we will invite Deacon Hamlet to give God thanks for the bread, and Deacon Nevers to give God thanks for the cup. First, lead us in the prayer of preparation. Let us pray. Shepherding God, you are the good shepherd that reminds us that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will bear no evil because you are with us. We come before you there. We know that we are worthy to take up the crumbs that fall from your table. We know that the prodigal son we were wayward, all doing our own faith enjoying the pleasures of this world but you are the good father hallelujah you are the one with outstretched arms that tear off the clothing of sin and shame and you clothe us with your goodness and mercy you cleanse our minds so that we will have a new heart and a renewed right spirit to worship you wash our bodies and cause us to be new creatures in Christ Jesus. We thank you that you prepared us for such a time as this. To come to you not because of any good work that we have done, lest we should boast, but we are drawn here by faith and saved through your grace. So we pray that as we send our hearts and minds to eat from you, that we will always dwell with you and you with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us listen to the words of institution. It was St. Paul that said, For I received from the Lord that which I pass unto you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night of the tree, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my one broken for you. In like manner, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. Or family, friends, as often as we eat this bread, as often as we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until Comes. As we send ourselves and celebrate the goodness of God, we will give God thanks for this wonderful blessing that God provides for us. Invite Deacon Hamnot to pray for the bread and Deacon Nevers pray for the book. Mine's 
thank you, Lord, for this another grand privilege to be seated around your well spring table. With our hearts prepare, Lord, we pray that you will take God and Father in heaven, we bring before you this morning our church and people. God of heaven, we pray that thou be in our midst. You know those of us that are at home at this time. Your hearts are here. It's like your hearts beating, wanting to be here. But because of various reasons, we find it impossible to be here. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us who are here to be here. We thank you for journeying mercy. We thank you, there is Father, for this And now, in particular, God, we bring before you bread, which symbolizes your broken body. Father in heaven, we pray that thou would assist us at this time, not to take it for granted, as we do it every morning. But we will do it realizing the response we are eating your body, your body which was once and on Calvary's cross. Father, that we commemorate this um, annually. Lord, some just do it as a sign. But then we were deeper, knowing we are not that we worship on the Calvary's cross. You broke your body and you feed your people. And you said, this we should do as often as possible. Because this morning we are here. We are here through what we call We pray, Father in heaven, that you will bless us. Bless us, dear Father, who is about to part May us clean enough here as God to part And that when we do here as Father, there are many of us who are kill at this time. We pray that they are means of healing us. Lord, we need your healing touch just now. Those that are at home, no kind of possibility to be here because of sickness. We pray that you will reach out that touch now, Lord, dear Father, that your body is among you. Bless us now, we pray, as we ask this and other things. Jesus Christ, all of you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary's cross for our sins. Lord, we present this wine unto you this day, Lord Jesus. It represents your blood, Lord, you shed on Calvary so that our sins can be forgiven. We pray, Lord, as we drink this morning, we will drink to your honor and your glory. We pray, Father God, that as we drink, you will strengthen us now, Lord. You will enable us to continue to serve you with our whole being. Continue to bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for distribution of the emblems, I want to remind persons that two deacons will be to the right and two to the left. We will come forward receiving bread and wine. We will come forward through the middle aisle and return to the side aisles. I want to also remind us that the ushers will be there to direct us and sanitize us as we come forward. As I shared earlier, if you are from a different denomination or a different church, but you are within the body of Christ, you are also able to participate in the Lord's Supper. For those who are joining online, we encourage you, as we believe these are symbols, if you have bread or biscuit, if you have water or juice at home, join us as we worship God through this powerful act of worship. I want to also remind those who are participating that for the wine, at the outer rings will be grape juice, and the inner rings will have stronger spirits. So I want you to be mindful as we participate in the Lord's Supper. The deacons will guide you as we continue to see the hymn, and can it be continued at verse 2. This mystery all Rise, who can explain? 
cup, symbolizing Christ's blood poured out for each and every one of us. Let us drink it all in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Our loving God, who poured out love on us by providing the opportunity to share at your table, we thank you for feeding us. Because when we eat of you, we are never hungry. Because we drink from you, we are no longer thirsty. We thank you that in this time we are able to remember your sacrifice for us, that you did not become someone who was selfish, but you were selfless as you died so that we might live. We celebrate the grace and mercy that was extended and that is continually being extended unto us as we meet at your table. And as we celebrate and thank you for feeding us, we remember those who because of ailment, because of age, aren't able to be here with us. We place before you Sister Nella Betty, her family, her daughter and granddaughter who nurture and take care of her. We thank you that you have kept her for over 90 years. And we pray that you continue to renew her strength. You wipe her tears. And from time to time she misses, truly misses, the assembly of God's people. We pray for Sister Hall, that you continue to surround her with love and compassion. We pray that you continue to bless Sister Walker, that you have guided her to this house this morning, and you continue to give her feet strength to serve you. We pray for Brother Rusty. We thank you, God, for those who avail themselves over him, so that he might be able to join us in worship. We thank you that you have been a part of his recovery and you give him that joy that is shut up within his bones and he lets out to praise you. We place look before you, Brother Chibar, that even though he is not able to see, you have given him sight. That even though he might be weary, you are the one that is his strength. We ask you to come to and take care of him. Take care of Sister McLean. Take care of all your people. We want to place before you, Brother Lewis, that you'll continue to wrap your arms around his family. We place before you, Sister Edwards, that yes, when she's here, she holds on to you, her solid rock. And we just pray that wherever she might be, that you will be her source of strength. We place it for you, Brother Bob, that at times you feel so alone at home. But we pray you continue to send persons, whether through call or through physical means, to keep his company and to remind him that he is a part of the family of God. We want to place it for you to support and Brother Mackenzie. We know, God, that you are the one that gave them strength to serve you while they were well. And even as they are old, that you will continue to renew their strength. Finally, want to place before you Deacon Hamlet. You know his desire to be here. You know his will to worship with your people. You know how much he served you while he was able to. The buildings, the, the work that he did around the church. But we also know that as human beings, our flesh will fail us. Our bodies will wither, but we are grateful that his spirit remains strong. We thank you for his wife that stands with him, and we pray that you continue to wipe his tears and remind him that what he has done, the, 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 the sacrifice he has made, is remembered by you. We pray for all our homeborn members. That even though they may be physically far, that they will be close to your hearts and they will be close to our hearts. Give us as a church a sense of duty and responsibility 
to remember them, to look for them, to call them, to remind them that yes, they are part of the family of God. We pray that you will continue to feed them and nourish them so that they will never be in love and they will have no words. We thank you for this opportunity to reflect and to tell you thanks. In Jesus' name, Amen. As the cups are being retrieved, remind persons to place the poem within the cup and uh, we will sing the hymn as the post communion hymn, say, Jesus came into my heart as the cups are being retrieved. Water. What a wonderful change.
934, and this will be done by our sister Elena Evers. New Testament, Philippians 2, 1 to 15. Sister Marcy. And a couple of people that done. Place 
of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that will come upon my father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes. 
Oh gosh, praise the Lord. We have we have we have uh, um, Kimani's mother here, yes. And we have our actress here in our harvest. Um so we are grateful to have each and every person, Sister Anne, Sister Maya, all those who came in after the welcome was extended. We are truly grateful that God gave us the opportunity to worship God. And we are doing so on the Jamaica Baptist Union theme of embracing the mystery. Now, the word mystery that is used in scripture, uh, especially in Greek, it speaks not of secret knowledge that is attained through human effort. Oh no. But instead, the scripture talks about the knowledge or understanding of God that is revealed to humanity by God. God is the one that is in control. And God is the one that reveals God's self to God's people. God is the mystery that is being revealed to us. God is the one that speaks in our lives. So it is not through tarrying, not through speaking in tongues, not through special oil that we buy for five thousand dollars. No, and you know you get a discount if you buy the prayer shawl as well. But no, what we find is that no one has the monopoly on God. That God speaks to whoever God chooses to speak to. Yeah. So God can speak to the young man on the road who most of the time is spending time on do a little thing like this. God can speak to, to the young lady who was at the party last night, Saturday night, and come to church this morning. God can speak to the worst of us, from sinners to saints. God decides who God speaks to, and God speaks to every and anyone who allows themselves to listen to him. So here we find that as a circuit, we will be embracing the mystery. And for the next quarter, we are embracing the mystery of the cross. Now, for the month of March, we are called to a time of repentance as we embrace the mystery. And we repented, and it was so fitting that in March we repented as we are and still are in the Lenten season. We were challenged to search ourselves, sisters and brothers, and to lose ourselves so that we can gain more of Christ. Now, I've heard it being said through the worship service, and I believe that it's the Spirit speaking, that so many times we just go through the routine. So, we take communion, we sing songs, we lift up prayers, but as Nick and Bobo pray, let it mean something to us. Let it, let it reach the very fibers of our being. Let it not just be another Sunday morning worship service. But for those who are hungry for the more of God, it should be more. That craving after more of Christ and less of us. Now as we draw closer to the mystery of the cross in the Easter period, we are called in the month of April to prepare to prepare. You see, the cross is a real mystery. In fact, all of Christendom is. Now, I want us to think about it. Think about it, Mrs. Lurley. The cross was a place of shame, ridicule, and disgrace. It was a place of public execution. The, the cross was somewhere people weren't excited to go. Yet, what we find is, as we embrace the mystery of the cross, is that God is transforming and causing the cross to not be a place of shame, but to be a place of sacrifice, to be a place of repentance, to be a place of healing, and of course, to be a place of grace. Now, the one who knew no sin, took sin upon himself. I'm not sure if you remember, Sister Ray, when you were a child and you get in trouble, and mommy asked you who do it. And nobody knows how to fess up because nobody knows how to get no beat. Not true. And sometimes you don't blame your sister or brother and say to them and they get the beat for you. No, no, think about that. Like, those people, they could be now in a warranty. But Jesus was willing to go and die even though he had no sin. He was willing to take on sin upon himself for people who about him. He did it so that we might live. And hence we are challenged, friends. I, I dare say compelled to take up our cross, to prepare 
prepare for the journey into the holy unknown and to deny ourselves daily so we may follow the will and purpose of our maker. So let us prepare. Let us prepare ourselves to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. Let us pray. God is the bottom. And we are the way. We have left ourselves open to you. So as we surrender through our prayers, our songs, through our lives, may we be renewed and refreshed. May we be agents within your kingdom. We pray that as your word is written, as your word is spoken, that it will provide comfort to the afflicted and it will afflict the comforted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to ask a question. Sister Maya, it's a rhetorical question now. But I want to ask a question. All of us a question, a rhetorical question. Are you a good Christian? Oh my. We get very quiet. Very quiet before, but now we get quiet. I think I hear the belly around you. The question that I have asked is a little flawed uh, because, it, it, but it's a necessary question. As it seems in the church, Jesus, or the church of Jesus Christ, we have more people playing church than actually wanting to be a Christian. I want to say it again. We see that in the modern day church, we have more people playing church than wanting to be a Christian. And what I mean by this is that only a portion of the gospel is being embraced. So we get excited about the music. Woo! I feel it down to my toes. What are the words of the, of the song that are challenging us to do? To become more like Christ. We like to hear the hot and spicy sermon. The one who tell us we're going to be blessed and highly favored. We don't like to hear the sermon that tells us we need to change our ways. And spend more time with God. Oh my God. We want to come from church after church and say, Yes, my church was hot. But what did we learn? And how were our lives impacted? We don't know about the drama when it's sweet. Mm. We, we instead are looking for prosperity. And as soon as we hear, and we're going to have to go through difficulty. We want to switch churches. But God challenges us, sisters and brothers. God says we should spend time with Him. And how do we see Him? We, we, we see Him through the lives of others. In fact, He's challenging us that we need to change. We need to stop spending time sitting on the road chatting other people's business and spend time in our secret place praying for those who are vulnerable and weak. And I didn't know him until I went there. We need to spend more time not just coming to church to socialize, but to actually develop a deeper relationship with God. We come Sunday after Sunday. Wondering what Sister Men is going to wear this week. We come Sunday after Sunday. Wondering how this sister or that brother is going to look. We spend Sunday after Sunday. Spending more time than our clothes. More time than our friends. More time on other people's business than seeking out for the goodness and mercy of God. Because God is not worried about who we look. God is concerned about the contents of our hearts. As we come before God, we should have a broken spirit and contrite heart which God does not despise. Psalm 51 verse 17. And not just 
the life that the person lives, but the life that I am living. It's not about your neighbor, you know, we love to touch your neighbor, this and touch your neighbor, that. Look on ourselves, what life am I living? And when nobody's seen us, think on Google and say, when nobody's seen us, what am I doing? What love am I showing to the other? How am I helping the broken and the downtrodden? Or am I living a life where in a here, Sister Mary, start calling me and so I hide the food. Sister Mary come and say, Why, Sister Paul, I'm hungry now. I say, Oh God, me pray for you, you know, me pray for you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I was hoping that you will leave and not smell the fire, the fire from the fire. Where we see the person on the street hungry and begging us for help. We are too busy. Are we going to church? We have missed the mark, sisters and brothers. But Jesus is telling us that we need to prepare to be people who gather into his house, not for entertainment, but for ministry. To be equipped so that when we go out into this world, people may see our good works and magnify our Father in heaven. God wants us to prepare so that we might live a life that pleases Him. So I ask us a question. Are we a Christian? One that is living a life of sacrifice, of generosity, of love. One that is free from malice, heat, gossip, covetousness, unforgiveness. What parts of my freedom are? She teeth me clothes, you know, and I'll no, she don't bring it back, you know. Forgiveness. If we aren't, then God shows us through God's word how to prepare so that we might go to the cross. So turn your attention with me, sisters and brothers, to so Philippians chapter 2. Read from verse 1 to verse 15. That challenges us to live a life, a life that is not selfish, it's a life that is selfless. Let us prepare to be selfless. Now, the author of the book is supposedly Paul, the Apostle Paul. And he writes to this young church from prison. Now, the early church was facing much opposition as a Roman colony that was mainly constituted by retired Roman soldiers. They were not strangers to war, but what was different about this war they were in was the approach to this warfare. The apostle shows them that the way they should fight was different. And he used his own life as a suffering servant as an example. That they weren't called to fight with sword and shield like they were used to. But no, they were called to a life wherein they are humble themselves and Follow the lead of the Father. He was in prison. However, he was spreading the gospel by the life that he lived. That even though I am prisoned, I am in prison for the gospel's sake. Now, one of the most beautiful images of selflessness as opposed to selfishness, like we look on last month, is seen in chapter 2. As it challenges the early church to imitate not just Paul, but to imitate Christ's humility. From the passage, we can learn some lessons. The, the first lesson I want us to reflect on, and we have our orders of service, the pastor said notes, so we can take our notes not to look back in the week. The, the, the first thing I want us to reflect on is the characteristics we should aspire for. I see in verses 1 to 2 and verse 15 of the text. The characteristics we should aspire for. The second is the conduct that is pleasing to God. I see in verses 3 to 4 and verses 12 to 14. The conduct that is pleasing to God. And thirdly, we look on the commonality that drives our lives. The commonality that drives our lives. I see in verses 6 to verse 11. So we look at the character we should aspire for. The conduct that is pleasing to God. And the commonality that drives our lives. So we have the same, and we're in 2020, and we have the same. Um, the Ricketts 
New year, new me. I hope that as we engage in God's word, we'll be saying new year, less of me, as prepared to be selfless. And we do so by learning the characteristics we should aspire for. Paul begins this new section in chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, with a transitional statement, therefore. And generally speaking, the therefore draws on what was said in verse in chapter 1, verse 27 to 30. But has its specific focus on what Paul says in verse 30 of chapter 1. That is, Paul appeals to them out of his suffering and struggling for the advancement of the gospel. Now, since he's doing this, they ought to stand firm and remain unified in the love of Christ. He can appeal to them as such. He has a great love for them. And since he considers them his joy and his crown, so he appeals to them. In other words, the passage commences with the characteristics that come with the territory of being a Christian. He speaks not about looking out for myself, nor about how we can get ahead in life, but instead he focuses on what truly matters in life. The passage is built around a single notion which is preceded by the phrase if, and then by. Now the if statement doesn't mean that Paul doubts what is happening. Now, Paul is not saying if you have encouragement in Christ, I'm, I'm not sure if you do. No, what, what Paul is saying, because or you have certainty in Christ, it's a rhetorical question. He says, since you have encouragement in Christ, since you have comfort provided by love, since you have fellowship with the spirits, and since you have affection and mercy, then make my joy complete. The passage as a whole is predicated on the idea found in verse 1. Sorry, chapter 1, verse 6, where Paul says that he is confident that the one who had begun a good work in them would carry it out to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. God's work in their hearts included such expressions as comfort, love, and fellowship with the Spirit. I hope you see it in the text, sisters and brothers. Now, it, it challenges us that we should show tenderness and compassion. And he says, have the same mind of Christ. That doesn't mean that we're all going to think and believe the same things, no. But the apostle is bringing to our attention what we should be focused on as believers. This is where our mind should be as the Spirit is linking us together. Now we have a common goal and that is to make these characteristics be seen by others and then lead them to worship God. We should seek to spread this gospel. Since we have received the encouragement from Christ, we have received his comfort and his love. We have the common spirit, so let us live life in the way Christ wants us to live it. What is beat in the church? Sister Lurie. What is beat in the church? Is people say, Chuck, can I have one more church? Because you pull out too much. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. I find it funny, Sister Annie, that people use this statement only to deal with church. Because when we go to work and our boss say one thing and do one next thing, we now have to stop our work. <laughs> you can never stop working. You can never stop working. You can never stop when we go in the Western Union line, and I say they want Stacey, you know they want Stacey. We say one thing, and do the other thing. And say, ah, oh, man, are evil. We now come out of the Western Union line. We come out of the Western Union line. I want hypocrisy. We now have collect the money. Who really ever said that? Our way may have wait, and you know what we start the situation say. And we are with not one or two, or two hours we are with the taxi. Not two sister in. And we see the one man's brown. The old hypocrite. You best believe we are small for silver and sit on the side of Mr. Brown. Because we need to go where we are going. We find that in our work, there's always going to be.
the hypocrites. But God tells us, you see, this church, this church is not for those who think they are perfect. You know, this church is not for those who think that they are saintly. This church is a hospital for those who know that they are sick. And Paul says, I am the worst of the sinners. Paul understands his sinful sin, and so he comes as a hypocrite, as a sinner, as one who crucified those who believed in Jesus. And he said, God, here I am. And I'm asking you to heal me. The beautiful thing about church is that all of us know we are imperfect. We have our faults and our failings. We have our wrongs and our rights. We, we are failing as human beings, but we come to God for mercy. And for His grace, He renew us. We come to Him for love. So if, and it's not like if we have love, He said, because we have God's love, we are comforted and encouraged through Him. That, that is the character we should have. A, a spirit of encouragement, a spirit of love, a spirit of charity, a spirit that says, yes, I believe in Christ. And I want others to believe in Him too. We provide encouragement for the downhearted. We provide comfort for those who are hurting. What do you can Google say this morning? I, I love him prayer. You know? Because he said so many of us in this in the church lazy. We don't want to know. Some of us say we're tired. In fact, we say. Make sister so and so do it. Make brother so and so do it. But we never see what we can do it. God tells us that we are called to encourage each other and to live in unity. That is the character we should seek after. That sending words to destroy people. Persons come to church with worries and burdens in them. And when they come to us, it's that I have started pouring their heart to us. Instead of encouraging them, we bring them news more far in. They might not call for the right time. Instead of encouraging them, we tell them because of their sin and because of this and because of generation, this and that. And we are called as a church to be a place of love. Of compassion, of encouragement, that when people come in, they feel the love saturated in the walls. And they don't want to come back because they know that these are people who genuinely love and care for them. So we ask the question, how come we church and I grow? Many times we are our worst enemy. So God challenges us as a whole church that we should be focused on who God is. God didn't call for my idea or your idea to win. God didn't call for you to be right or me to be wrong. What God seeks after and what we should seek after is for each person to align themselves with the Master's will. So if that is what we're supposed to seek after, we can go. But we get begs when we share something and other person's suggestion get used over us. You know what we get begs? Yeah. Why do we get so upset when we're supposed to do something at church and we're excited to do it until we hear say our sister so and so in charge of it? Why do we pick and choose which Sunday we come to church based on who the preacher is? Because we are seeking after our own will and our own purposes. We are seeking for the gratification of flesh instead of embodying the characteristics of God. God challenges us, sisters and brothers, that we should ensure that our motives for what we do is based on His will. That's all possible. The body is called to be united. Because it is not army of Christ's kingdom. It is not Baptist kingdom. It is not Methodist kingdom. It is not Anglican kingdom. It is not Catholic kingdom. It is the kingdom of God. That is what we signed up for. Or 
secondly, because I, I can hear the, the fried chicken bubbling. Not only are we challenged to aspire for certain characteristics of love and comfort, of encouragement, but, but we are called to have conduct that is pleasing to God, right? You can have conduct that is pleasing to God, right? So I want to ask us, for the students that are here, what is our motivation when we go to school? Nothing. What is your motivation when you go to school? What about the people who work? What is our motivation when we go to work? Alright, let me make it closer to work. What is our motivation when we come to church? To see God. When the apostle challenges us about our conduct that stems from our motivation. So he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, vain conceit. And he challenged us in verse 15, he said, to work when no one else is around. So I want us to look at it um, in verses 3 to 4 and 12 to 14. He challenges our, our motive, our conduct. So he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. And what this, this is not a revolutionary idea, you know, because we are... In our society, selfish. Look at what is happening around us. We are taught to look out for who? Ourselves. Me. And secondly, we have to look out for I. And thirdly, you know, you can't forget myself. Me, myself, and I. That's who we are called to look out for. That's what we are taught. That we have to get ahead. Because. Only one person can get first place in the, in the classroom. But Mrs. Reed, you work in the school and the moguls. Everybody can get 100, not true. I think not it. Can everybody excel without somebody else being diminished? I've seen it so many times when people call me study group. And those who are Brilliant. So you don't have the time. But the persons who are struggling are left to fend for themselves. Are we being selfless or selfish? Think about it. What about the workplace? How far do we go to get the promotion? What rumors do we spread? Because it is between you and Jane. And when those whispers up when somebody is, you know, say, me here, say, Jane, I'm treating my name. But you don't hear it from me. You really want to be manager? Mm -hmm. Hey, three years ago, Jane, see me on road and, and pass me, you know. You don't really want she in charge, but you don't hear it from me. about our homes? Are we being selfless in care of others? I want to think about this now. Children, when, when you're going to do something for your parents, do you do it out of the goodness of your heart? No. Not even I look at me. Or do you do it because you know if you get a reward at the end? Can you get something? So we do well in school so we can get the tablet. We, we help out around the house so we can get the football. We be very so kind to others so we can go get to play some free fire. What are our motives, sisters and brothers? Are we doing things selflessly? Or do we have selfish ambitions? Are you in the church? It's a holy place. It's a godly place. Do we serve out of the goodness of our heart? Or do we serve so others can see us? Do we serve because we know we're serving God? Or do we serve because we are never as a friend? Do we serve? Because God has commanded us to. 
And do we serve? We come on get big up next week. Our friend let it go play um, at harvest. A little skit. And she was hoping that the pastor would call her name. But many times people do things so the pastor so the leader can call the names. So that can get the clap. The, the, the big up. But are we serving so that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing? Are we being vain, prideful in what we are doing? Where we look at some people as up there. You know, I can be friends with them because when I be friends with them, they're going to be able to give me some reward. I can learn sister and the money because I know sister and they're in a partner, so by next week we can get it back. I do we do things the way that when we lend, when we give to others, they aren't able to give us back. Are we willing to do when nobody else is watching? I share with us a story. I remember a few years back, I was at a particular church, and the person was cleaning the church for about 20 years. She became ill because of us. And the church had to meet and wonder, how are we going to clean the church? And three sisters, who have work, family, and responsibilities, decided that each Saturday, they were going to call and clean. But one of the sisters really stood out to me because she had arthritis. And she would clean a little and then sit down and rest the knees. And then clean. And you know what I tell one woman, you know, she wanted to serve God so much that she was willing to go the extra mile. I shared this with her. We have to really challenge our minds. Is the things that we do, are we doing it with the right heart behind it? Because our actions come from here. And if here is right, then no matter how much we do, the actions will never be right. Because the actions of the heart are not seen by men and women. They are seen by God. It doesn't ensure that our conduct is found right in the sight of God. But finally, as you put on the grave, the chicken finish fries and stuff, this is like, you put on the grave. Finally, the, the commonality that drives our lives. In verses 6 to 11, we see this. I ask us the question Who is our role model? Brother Travis. Some of us aspire to be like Martin Luther King. Others want to be like good old Bob, you know, the Buffalo soldier. Others want to be rich like Elon Musk. And others want to take a journey like 450. And some of us want to build walls like Trump. Yet, Paul uses his own life of struggle and hardship. And he presents himself as a role model unto the church. He says that his greatest inspiration, his greatest role model throughout history is Christ. I read it again for emphasis. He says, in your relationship with one another, verse 5, have the same mind. As Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being formed in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. 
It is commonality that we all share, that we all should be aspiring to as Christians, is to be like Christ. That's it. Take on the nature of servanthood. No, pastor, you may not like that one later. Servant. But I want to be a pastor. I want my name to be known. I want to be bishop, evangelist, minister, pastor. I need people to know me. But Jesus says we have to take on attitude of a servant. Hence Paul's greatest title is not apostle, nor is it missionary to the Gentiles. No. His greatest subtitle as found in scripture servant of God. Think about it. Because this is where we get our example of servanthood. Jesus was equal to God. But he saw our needs and he made a selfless sacrifice and came not only to be a human, but he came to die for our sins. He was a man of service and it is that mindset we should have. So how can we serve God? But what is seen first? Can we serve? Can we, can we worship? What is seen first? Is it our here? Hey, the canal, is that you here? Yes, girl. Is it our clothes? Wow. As a true Christian, look how beautiful, handsome they look. As a deacon, I'm over laughing. Is it the titles that come with our name? Ensure you remember that I am Reverend Dr. Bishop. Or is it the fact that we are children of God? Which one is more important to us? So how do we display this driving force, this commonality of Christ in our homes? We display Christ in our homes by remembering that we are a Christian 24 7. Pastor, I'm always praying and having a devotion. Even if when I wake up, I'm inside the throne, this prayer back up on him. Are we a Christian then? When the husband gone out and we decide we need a new hairstyle and we just help ourselves to the wallet. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Are we a Christian then? Yeah. <laughs> when the children get us cross, angry, angry. and a miserable and we start cutting some cloths in the household, yeah. are we still a Christian? Are we a Christian at school with this development of everybody wanting to be guarded? Everybody wants a guard. And so we have this ring and that ring. And this chain and that chain because we have to protect ourselves. Are we a Christian? Knowing that we don't need no ring or chain for our protection because we are covered under the blood of Jesus. Are we a Christian? When this time comes, are we not studying? But the smart person come right beside me. Oi! Sister Walker! Are we a Christian when we just get in new brand shoes? And I'm going to take a Are we a Christian then? And these are realities, you know. It's really, you know, this are we a Christian. When we see Jesus and I talk to um, Shania, you know, say, Jesus is mine. Uh -huh. Are we going to take off our earring then? Oh my God. Are we a Christian? 
when we say adults being bullied? Nothing. Are we going to join? Or are we going to be that lone voice calling out in the wilderness? What about our workplace?
thinking of others before ourselves. Let us prepare in this Lenten season to live a selfless life, to aspire to the characteristics that are formed in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, to seek to have the right conduct that is pleasing unto God, to share in that common source that drives our lives, to look to Christ as He teaches us how to think, how to speak, and how to live. May we send ourselves as servants of God, saying, Lord, all to you, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. As we surrender our hurts, we surrender our pains. We surrender our wrong ways of thinking. We surrender those persons we have kept in our hearts for so long. We surrender our minds that have been warped by this world. We surrender our lips because sometimes we feel like we need to know we want. We surrender our lives. We surrender all. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. As we join together in the singing of the hymn, the hymn of commitment, all to Jesus. I surrender all to him and freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. And if you are here today, you want prayer. I don't need to know what you need prayer for. But we come in agreement as people of God. And we say, God, we are here for you as a church. We are here to encourage you. We are here to show you God's love. Here is the altar. A place, not of shame, but a place of surrender. A place not of condemnation, but a place of grace. I invite you to come as we pray with each other. As I pray for you. And we trust that whatever we bring before God, that Christ, our suffering servant, will hear our faith and will answer our prayers and surrender.
you remind us that you have plans for us, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us a hope and a future. Oh God, we are placing ourselves before you and you see those parts of us that are unwanted. You see those parts of us that aren't alive with your spirit and we place them before you. You see the malice, the unforgiveness, the covetousness, the selfishness, the self-glorification. You see those parts of us that we try to hide away and God, we, we're not hiding them, we're bringing them before you, asking you as you use a refine us, fire to purify us, oh God. And you tear the life pulled from your mouth and you touch our lips. And that life pulled will, will move from the fiber of our being and will cut and remove all of the parts of us that isn't a part of you. God, we declare today that we will not allow for the flesh to rule. We will feed upon your, the fruit that comes from your spirit. God, forgive us. Forgive us some when we have allowed ourselves to doubt and worry. Forgive us of allowing for our minds to be preoccupied with the problems of turning them to the problem solver. Forgive us, oh God, for taking your time, your treasure, your talents, and squandering them, oh God. Forgive us. Allowing himself to go before your spirit. But we declare that self will be slain. We, we want to thank you that even as we come before you and pour it out, that you remind us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are able to come for our new outpouring of grace. We are able to come for our new outpouring of mercy. We are able to come for our new outpouring of your love. Because your love cleanses and washes away our sins. God, change our minds. Help us not to live as victims or defeated people. But may we know that the victory has been won through Christ Jesus. May we walk in the victory in the here and now. May we know that healing is, is ours, God. May we know that salvation is ours. May we know that freedom and liberty from sin is ours. By your sacrifice. God, may we not come with just words, but may we open our hearts to you. You tell us your word that we should seek you first, your kingdom, and your righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto us. God, we have sought your kingdom, and we are seeking to be righteous before you each and every day by depending upon you. So we ask for all of the things shall be added unto your people. We ask for your love. We ask for peace that passes all understanding to be ours. So no matter if we are in the workplace or in the dwelling place, no matter if we are in the school or in the worship space, that we will experience your peace that passes all understanding. And you will breathe a word of worship in our lives. And so that your word will not just be written in, in, in the holy book, but it will be written on our hearts. So that we will not sin against sin. God, help us not to come to this altar and re return the same. But help us to know that the shackles have fallen. That we are delivered. Not by any good thing that we have done, but by your wonderful power and might. God, there are persons who are shackled by sin, who are shackled by shame. And we just pray that you will speak a word of encouragement in your lives that says, I am not come for those who think that they are righteous. May you speak a word that tells them, I have come to bring sinners to repentance. May you speak a word in our spirit that tells us that you have come for me. May we see that we are accepted by you. been redeemed through you. And may we know that no matter how sinful we are, you said that your blood cover over a multitude of sin because your blood represents love. And 
have your way in our lives, oh God. We are saying we are surrendering to you, God. So we are saying not our will, but your will be done. We are, we are seeking you first, oh God. We are seeking, we are listening to your voice. So that when we walk and when we go forward, when we speak, when we think, it's all to be in alignment with your purpose and plan for our lives. God, we set to be set free. As you tell us who the Son set free, is free indeed. Who the Son set free, is free indeed. May we leave, even though we feel like weeping, Hannah. May we leave rejoicing because you have heard our prayers. You will rescue us from our affliction. And you will purify us so that we walk like pure woman. Send us forth with your love, with your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And we just get a shoulder of victory. Thank you for joining us online. May the peace of God always be yours. Shalom.